Scientists are skeptical. I mean, they have to be, right? That's the whole point of the scientific method. You know, uh, don't believe something unless there's enough evidence to show that it's true. But that becomes a big problem for science writers, particularly when it comes to scientific abstracts, because it turns out that the number one goal of a scientific abstract is to establish trust with your reader. Why? Because if, by the end of your abstract, the reader doesn't completely trust you, there's no way they're gonna read your report. And this is where so many science writers go wrong. They think that the abstract is just a scaled down version of the whole paper. And so what they do is basically summarize the whole paper in five or six sentences, usually with the most clinical, passive language you could ever imagine. The truth is that your research can perform all the processes and find all the findings it wants, and it won't make a bit of difference if the reader doesn't read it. I set out to try and find a way to show you how to earn the trust of your reader and convert your research into knowledge. And that's when I remembered that one of the world's most highly cited scientists, somebody whose research has enormous impact, actually works down the hall from me. Dr. Beck Jungbaum is an impressive science writer, so pulling apart the abstract to some of his most highly cited papers is going to let you in on some of the most important features of scientific abstracts. So I read through the abstracts of Dr. Beck's articles, and the first thing that stuck out to me was how they give the answer to reader questions quickly and clearly. So imagine that you were a busy scientist and you're, you know, quickly scanning through all these papers, trying to decide, you know, should I read this one or should I read that one? What questions do you think you have right at the forefront of your mind? The first question you would probably ask is, what's the problem? Because the problem is what gives your research value. If your research isn't oriented towards a problem, then the findings, the interpretation, the methods, none of it's worth anything unless it's put into service of solving a reader's problem. The problem is what gives your research value. And that's why Dr. Beck's abstracts always answer this reader question, what's the problem? right up front. The part of the abstract that answers this question, uh, you could call it the problem. Uh, I like to call it the purpose. Depending on which guide or textbook you're gonna be working with, it might also refer to it as the question. Doesn't matter. The point is that this early section in the abstract establishes the problem that the research is trying to solve. This kind of strong opening that we see in Dr. Beck's abstracts, it's missing from a lot of the abstracts of those science writers who think that an abstract is just a scaled down version of the whole report. Those reports might open by identifying a topic and then launching straight into their experiment. I guess these writers think that the value of their research will speak for itself. The problem is, it doesn't. It's actually really hard to identify the importance of research if we don't establish it within the context of a problem. Otherwise, it just kind of looks like we're sitting around in a lab doing science experiments. I mean, what's the point? If there's a point, it should be targeting a certain pain point, a problem, perhaps one that the reader is having, because that is going to encourage the reader to move beyond the abstract into your introduction. The most common verbs used in this section are discuss, describe, explore, and address. But just as soon as the purpose answers one question, it raises another. And that was the next thing I noticed in Dr. Beck's abstracts. It was how well he anticipates this next reader question and how quickly he answers it. The next question being naturally, how will you solve the problem? Makes sense, right? I mean, if you're gonna describe a problem, the next thing the reader's gonna wanna know is how did you go about solving it? Dr. Beck is a material scientist, so in this section, he's usually describing the experimental method that he went through, but depending on the type of research that you're doing, you might wanna describe the assumptions you made to arrive at a certain conclusion, or the data that you used, and how you went about collecting it. Seems like it's best to keep this section short and sweet, so one to two sentences max. And you know, a lot of editors really like to hate on the passive voice, and I'm one of them. But I have to say, in this section, when you're describing the experimental steps you took, it's perfectly reasonable to use the passive voice. Because think about it, what is the passive voice? What's wrong with it? The passive voice moves the focus away from the actor and onto the thing that is receiving the action of the verb. So in the case of describing the steps of an experiment, 
the focus really doesn't need to be on the subject. We, we did this, we did that. The, the focus really needs to be on the thing receiving the action and the process as a whole. So take the actor out of there if you want, put it over in a prepositional biphrase, and keep the focus on the experiment. And just as before, the answer to the second question leads us to a third question. And it's a natural one because, of course, after you describe how you went about solving the problem, the reader's going to want to know, so what happened? This is the most important part of your research, and it should take up the most room. It's where you describe your findings. If you only have one main finding that you want the reader to take home from your research, then use one sentence. If there are two main findings, use two sentences but try to keep it under three sentences in length. You know, if you think about publishing a research report as the attempt to convert your research into knowledge, you know, shared knowledge among the scientific community, then in this section, it's what's gonna contain your primary contribution. You know, this is what you're handing over to your readership to say, you know, here's my contribution. I want you to test it, I want you to challenge it, and if there's nothing wrong with it, I want you to accept it as new knowledge. So make sure that in these one, two, or three sentences, you've really distilled and really highlighted the most important findings from your research. And the most common verbs I found in this section of the abstract were find, demonstrate, and establish. And last but not least, the reader has one more question for us. And when you think about it, it's kind of the most important question, because if we can't answer this question, we really have no business trying to submit this research for publication. And that question, is so what? In other words, the conclusion points outside the research to its implications and applications to the wider world. But please make sure in this section you are not too vague. It's all too common to see writers say, you know, this research will have many applications in industry or, you know, something like that. Like, think through the implications of your research and really think about, you know, what kind of impact could it have outside the narrow scope of your own discipline. Now, if your abstract answers these four questions quickly and clearly, you should have no trouble establishing trust with your reader and getting them to read the rest of your report. But as I mentioned, there is a fifth question which we may or may not want to answer. It depends on the field that you're writing in. And this is where so many science writers go wrong. They just follow a script, they answer this question at the beginning when they don't really have to, and it winds up turning off their readers. So before I give you this question, I want you to think carefully about the field that you're writing in and the people, the community that you're writing to, because that is going to determine whether or not you should include this question. And so my question for you is, is the field you're writing in urban or rural? Let me explain. In some fields, and particularly in the hard sciences, there is a large number of people working on a small number of problems, and they have a commonly established and agreed upon way of doing things. They have a set of procedures, methods that they all follow, and they're very well established and very known throughout the community. In biology, if I had discovered a new gene, I wouldn't really want to open the abstract by saying genes have been receiving a lot of attention recently because it's fair and probably even respectful to assume that my reader knows about the Human Genome Project. So those are urban research communities on the one hand, and on the other hand we have rural research communities in which the set of problems aren't really so well defined and the methodologies for solving problems aren't very well established. They, they vary between researchers depending on their theoretical background, their approach, all kinds of factors. So there's not really a lot of overlap in the research interests between these researchers. This is a lot more common in the social sciences and the humanities, and it requires a lot more work on the part of the writer to get the reader up to speed. You need to make sure the reader fully understands the context so that they can establish 
the importance of your research. For that reason, that fifth reader question that I mentioned earlier, the one that I've been teasing you with this whole time, well, it's really only appropriate in rural research communities. It doesn't really fit in urban research communities. And in fact, the data shows that they don't really appear very often in urban research communities. So what is that question? Well, the question is, what's this about? You know, a reader coming to your research report, before they even get to the problem, they're gonna wanna know the topic. What are you talking about? So this is where we establish the context and identify the motivation of the research leading up to the problem. We still want to establish a problem, but we introduce the problem by setting the context and the framework for the discussion. So that section we're gonna call the intro, and it's a lot more common in rural research communities, the humanities, the social sciences, than it is in the hard sciences. So now we've identified five reader questions that we need to answer if we want to establish trust with our reader. And we've also identified their five corresponding parts in the scientific abstract. But how do they all fit together? And what structure should you use for your scientific abstract? Well, we actually have some really good data on this. So check this out. In the book, Disciplinary Discourses, Ken Kyland analyzes the structure of the abstract of over 800 scientific articles. And what he found is that the most common structure for a scientific abstract by far is purpose, method, product. Notice that missing from this is introduction and conclusion. And that makes a lot of sense because scientists and engineers interact in urban environments where the problems and their outcomes are very well established. So these writers don't waste a lot of ink establishing the context because everyone knows that. The people in these communities basically just want to know three things. What's the problem? How do you solve it? What did you find? The truth is that there really is no magic formula to the structure of your scientific abstract. Honestly, the way to think about an abstract is to think about an advertisement. They're really doing the same thing. I mean, what do ads do? You know, ads, they take a potential customer, you know, and what they do is they try to get inside the mind of that potential customer and try to push their buttons in order to convert them into a paying customer. Good ads, you know, they don't just give the shopper all this information about the product. You know, early ads used to do that. Like if you look at 1920s ads for Model T cars and that kind of thing, you know, you see these ads with all this information printed on it. But modern ads are a lot more likely to be some sexy model in a sports car. <sighs> in other words, an effective advertisement is one that gets inside the mind of the consumer in order to manipulate their behavior. And I hate to break it to you, folks, but that's exactly what we're doing with these scientific abstracts. We are manipulating the behavior of the reader. We are trying to get them to read the rest of our report. And the way that we do that is by building trust with them. We do that by answering their questions so that by the end of the abstract, the reader is thinking, oh, wow, this writer, you know, really gets me. I trust this writer. I'm going to follow them into the introduction. That's a successful abstract, not one that condenses all the information, all the claims and the findings and the inter whatever, everything from the paper into five or six sentences. That's not it. It's not about the information. The successful abstract is one that makes the reader read the rest of the report. And the way that we do that is by answering the reader's questions. Now, again, you need to think carefully about the discourse community that you're writing for, because trying to answer all these reader questions in the abstract is one of the most common mistakes that we see in scientific abstracts, which is why you need to check out this video, because it's going to give you the top five mistakes that we see in scientific abstracts, how to spot them and how to fix them. So be sure to go check it out.